Welcome to the tea table. I am so happy you have joined me today. It's a gorgeous July, early July, I want to say day, because we want to enjoy summer as long as we can, right? Well, if you haven't gotten your tea yet, please pause and get your tea and I'll be waiting for you. I really look forward to seeing you every week and talking to you and I can only share what's in my heart and what I have been enjoying and this last week well all summer I told you I intentionally got off the merry-go-round. I'm a professor during the year and I do a lot of studies and a lot of work and I felt like I needed a sabbatical and so my summer is a time of rest. And so I've been studying but different things. They all involve history however and it all fits together. It all makes sense. But my husband and I have been watching these fabulous documentaries on sea captains and Sir Francis Drake, who served under good Queen Bess, Queen Elizabeth I of England. And so today we're going to take, we're going to go on a boat and we're going to go to sea. And we have behind us the Puget Sound this is Elbe Inlet behind me, and it's either considered the very beginning of the Puget Sound or the end. Because if you go that way on a boat, you can literally go anywhere. You can go around the world. You'd go through all the islands, through Seattle, up to past Everett, and go up into the um, San Juan Islands and then work your way up to Vancouver and you could go off then through the Straits of Juan de Fuca to the open ocean to the Pacific. So I have a tea set today that I think fits very well and on the front of it I chose for our treat crackers and they're little rice crackers but on the ships, they could never take bread. That's why you've heard of Sailor Boy crackers, the big white hard crackers, because they don't go moldy. The food was pretty bad on the ships after a while, unless they could get to land and get something from the people that were living on the land. But often it was months on the open ocean. So this is a really interesting little combination. There's a cup for you and a cup for me and a little portable tea set. The teapot is on the bottom, then it's the sugar bowl, and then it's the creamer on top and the lid. And so it's very, very portable. And I think this set was used for either on a ship or on a train, it's travel. So I will take off the sugar bowl, or I'm sorry, the creamer first, and then the little sugar bowl, we'll put it over here. It's all silver. Silver keeps it hot, yes. And I will pour out. Nice and hot. It's just enough for one person, a little bit of Whoever invented this was an engineer. They were thinking of everything. I have to drink with my right hand, so. Mmm, brisk black British tea that came from Africa, India, Middle East. How did they get the tea? By ships, yes. How did they get the coffee? By ships. How did they get many of the exotic spices? By ships. 
even things like lovely raspberries. I put berries on, isn't this beautiful? I put it on a little plate that is English. Just a sweet little red and white plate and this is a bowl of raspberries. They may have gone to shore and been able to get some berries, yes. Now England grows berries very nicely, so does all of Northern Europe, Scandinavia, they have the linden berries, and we have berries, all kinds of berries here. The rainy climates do well with the berries and then the sun. But on the ship, they had to be content to have what they could have, yes. Well, I have on my table, this is a geranium, and this is in a Dutch pot which also, there's the windmill, and that's a waterway. And this table is wobbly, let's see. And then these I wanted to show you. Dahlias, I just got this pot of dahlias and I'm gonna plant it in a bigger pot. But I like everything, the blue and white is such a nice compliment, isn't it? Well, we're right here on the sea, and this is called Puget Sound, Elbe Inlet. And that I've discovered, I've been studying about these sea captains. It was Captain Vancouver that had a young man named Puget, and he was a very, very good sailor. And so what Captain Vancouver did as he went through all these waterways and did maps, now that was in the 1700s, late 1700s. And Captain Vancouver only lived to be 40 years of age. But they said his maps are so meticulous and so perfect that they still use them today. And he went all up to Alaska and met the Clinkett, Southern Alaska, down the coast of Canada, Vancouver Island, Victoria, BC, Washington, Oregon, California. And so when he came here and found the Puget Sound, he had Captain Puget go out and explore. And that's why it's called Puget Sound. Isn't that interesting? Yes, there's always a story behind a story. Well, the tea talk is kind of like show and tell kind of like a museum. This is a ship that I had. It's called the Vasa. This is from the 1600s. It's a collection that was, I only have two plates, but there must be many because the two I have are this one, which is very similar to Sir Francis Drake's ships that I'm going to talk about in the 1600s with all the sails no steam remember they didn't have steam they had to go with a little compass and go by their instincts and go by the maps that other people had drawn and my other i'll just show you the other plate i have this goes back two thousand years before christ this is cleopatra's boat isn't that interesting so and that's in the middle east that's egypt in the background there so the boats always had to have sails because they depended on the wind. A sailboat today will have a motor in case the wind stops blowing, right? They didn't have that advantage. These people had to go with incredible courage. I think anyone on the sea, even today, you have to have courage and you have to be smart and you have to be wise and you have to be humble enough to take counsel and don't, don't just go ahead. It's like flying a plane. You, you make sure the weather is good. You make sure your instruments are, you do your best to make everything right before you take off. Well, my name is Susan Elizabeth. And so I've always loved Queen Elizabeth, the recent Queen Elizabeth II. She's very special to me, to all of us. She was our queen our whole lives. What a gift. But 
She's Queen Elizabeth II because there was a Queen Elizabeth I, yes, in the 1500s. The daughter of Henry VIII and her mother was Anne Boleyn, the second wife of Henry VIII. Well, she was a very unique person. She never married. She was very strong. She could hold her own with the sailors. She could give the commands. Everyone respected good Queen Bess. And she found herself in a situation where at her era, remember her father, Henry VIII, when he married her mother, the second wife, he had to divorce the first wife, Catherine of Aragon, who was Catholic. Catherine of Aragon produced a daughter and that's Mary Tudor, but she didn't produce a son. And Henry VIII was just, he became just almost rabid to have a son. And he became this, he actually became a tyrant eventually just to have a son. But when he started out, he was a young, handsome prince with red golden hair and blue eyes and very athletic and very popular among all the people. Well, Catherine of Aragon, that first, his first wife, was the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella. Now, isn't that interesting how that connects? Remember Columbus, 1492, was given the money from Isabella to go on the exploration to America? Well, we're only in the early 15s and Henry VIII comes on the scene. We have Shakespeare coming up. We have the Protestant Reformation happening in Germany. We have William Tyndale translating the Bible. We have a whole movement of Reformation Protestants in England. And so when Henry VIII wanted to divorce uh, Catherine of Aragon, the Pope said no. And so you know what Henry VIII did? He goes, well, I will become the head of the Church of England. And so he split with the Pope and England became Protestant. That's how England became Protestant. So in the meantime, he had these two daughters and another son, Edward, who was sickly. Well, when he died, he ruled for 37 years. When he died, the young Edward came on the throne, but he wasn't strong and he didn't have the capacity. So he ended up passing away. He died young. And the one that took it then was Mary, the daughter of Catherine of Aragon. And she's called Mary Tudor. It gets really confusing because you have Mary Tudor. And then at the same time in Scotland, you have Mary, Queen of Scots. You've heard of her or Bloody Mary. She was also Catholic and she was wanted to have rule and um, she married a man and her husband and her began to crack down on any Protestants and persecute them. You may have heard of the great man preacher named John Knox, who had studied in Vienna, I'm sorry, in Geneva with John Calvin. Well, he had come back to Scotland and he was preaching because he was a reformer. He wanted reformation, just like Martin Luther. And she said, her, one of her famous lines is, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the armies of England because she, she was doing things the people didn't like. Well, that's the Mary, okay, that's Bloody Mary. We're not gonna talk about her very much, Mary Stewart. But you have this Mary ruling in England and she is Catholic. And so she's trying to bring England back to Catholicism. She marries Philip of Spain. Well, he's 10 years younger than her. She loves him. He's not that crazy about her, but it's a political marriage. Because Spain is trying to get back to take control of England and make it Catholic. Well, then Mary, she, she had a child, but um, 
she was not able to really, I think she became very ill and died. And I, um, she couldn't, she couldn't continue reigning. So he went back. So then Elizabeth came to the throne. That's how she got there through all of that complication. Well, her cousin in Scotland is Mary, Queen of Scots. They're cousins. But she can't really trust her because she wants to come down and make England Catholic too. So there's all this intrigue in the palace. You know, it's you can see where Shakespeare got all of it. Well, he gets it from everything in history. There's always intrigue. There are always people that are good and there's always people that want to change and then there's always people that come and get around the king or the queen to have control it's a battle it's always a battle isn't it so nothing new under the sun but elizabeth realized that philip of spain then he was building this spanish armada they had gone exploring to south america and they had gold they were rich and she said, why can't England have some gold? Well, this is where Sir Francis Drake comes on the scene. And Sir Francis Drake is a man of the sea. And he said, we can go. I'll go for you, good Queen Bess. I'll go get the pirates. Because the pirates were taking stuff from the British ships. And they were trying. But when he got out on the sea, he realized Spain had all the gold. Philip had all the gold, so he said, I'm going to have a little bit of that too. So he brought it back to Elizabeth. Well, he was a hero. Philip didn't like it, and Philip said, we're going to build an armada. And the Spanish armada was this massive collection of ships. I mean, a huge collection of ships. And they were higher level than the British ships. They were perfect. They were massive. They had the they had so much gold. They had blocks of gold and silver and jewels and pearls and everything. But Sir Francis Drake, kind of like Dunkirk, the British, he was an improviser. And he had a small ship that could go around and he faked them out. It's all on a documentary and a movie and a book you can study. Long story short, they defeated the Spanish Armada. And because of that, England remained Protestant. And Queen Elizabeth had a coin made, a big silver coin, and it said, she said, God has saved us. And Francis Drake has been used by God to help us save our nation and become a ship nation. And her coin said, he sent his winds and saved them. Or he sent his winds and saved us. I don't know the exact. And that's where Britannica rules the waves and the British Navy was built after that and all the ships and all the... Then you had Sir Walter Raleigh later. And Well, I want to highly recommend, there's many documentaries. There's a really good documentary done from England on Sir Francis Drake. And then my husband and I found a 1932 movie all about Sir Francis Drake and Elizabeth. And it is so well done, 1932. Now that is almost a hundred years ago. And the movie is so brilliant, so beautiful. I highly recommend it. You can find it on YouTube. Just say movie on Francis Drake, 1930s, it'll pop up. I cannot remember the name of it, but it is worth seeing. It's, it's clean, it's happy, it's romantic, and he has true love, and his wife is played by Helen Hayes, and she loves him, and he succeeds, and it's, it's everything a good movie, a good story could be, should be. So I just wanted to share that with all of you. And I, I think that studying history, British history is not easy. So many kings. You've got James I, James II, James III. You've got all the Charles, Charles I, Charles II. 
And for we Americans, you know, we need to take it apart. But I think the best way is studying, like one man studying Sir Francis Drake and then studying all the people he relates to. And suddenly you you have the whole world of the 1500s. You know, like I said, you you had Shakespeare and you have all of this happening. And then as it moves along, England becomes this really powerful sea power and they go and bring back the tea. <laughs> Speaking of tea, it has to come by the ship and the coffee and the spices and all of the other treasures. Then we, I wanted to talk a little bit about Captain Vancouver. He's in the late 1700s during the American Revolution. So almost 200 years later, because no one had really mapped out the Pacific Ocean West Coast where I live up California, Oregon, Washington, going up to Straits of Juan de Fuca, Vancouver, up to Alaska. And he went all the way and met all the native people. He was beloved by them. He had very good diplomatic skills. He honored people. He knew how to keep, how to receive and how to give. And he also, like I said, he would name places after the different people that were on his ship. He honored them. Captain Vancouver died when he was 40, very young. but. His maps were so good and are so good, they are still used today. It's incredible. He had the ability to just, to, had the patience to go around each little sound and he had to get into smaller boats to go through the islands and um, really be able to map it out. It took him several years and the one thing he missed, they said that he didn't put on the map was the Columbia River and the Canadian Fraser River, which they don't know why. It's a mystery why he didn't put those on. But everything else was there. And so that would have been a big help to Lewis and Clark when they came, you know, about 50 years later or less than that even. And because um, Lewis and Clark were right out here, um, on the, you know, if you go to Seaside, Oregon, there's a statue of them, and it says, end of the road, they got to the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, all the names here are, you know, Lewis County, Clark County, Lewiston, Idaho, Clarkson, Washington, we have Vancouver, Washington, Vancouver, BC, and they put up in Victoria, which is the capital of British Columbia, of the province, the beautiful dome and capitol building on the top is Captain Vancouver, life-size, all gold. Isn't that beautiful? Whoops, I knew that was going to happen. This is a little, I love the breeze though today. The breeze is so nice. Just move this forward a little bit here. So, it's so nice to see all of you today. And I just hope you've been having a good week and a good summer. And maybe there's an area that you're studying. And I appreciate so much when you subscribe to my channel because it's hard for me to get these out to everyone. I've got so many people now. So if you like it, please like it and share it with others. Encourage them to subscribe. And please, if you have a comment, please, I would really love your comments. And I'm wearing today some jewelry that actually was, reminds me of Bedouin, Middle Eastern Bedouin. I feel like my outfit is around the world. We've gone around the world. Francis Drake is the first one who actually circum went all the way around the globe. He went all the way around. He went through the Straits of Magellan. He went places no people said he could never go. And he was really the pioneer of, of, of mapping and sea all the way around and just an incredible person. But um, 
so my hat I feel is kind of Asian actually I don't know why it just feels like maybe Asian my scarf feels kind of East Indian I've got this and then I've got a purse that could go anywhere I love this kind of straw purse in the summer it's structured and holds everything nicely and it has a pattern that almost looks South American I think I've got all the continents covered and this little cup has a map of the world it's all around the world our cups today these are old maps old maps that were drawn so your cup and my cup isn't that nice well, I just really appreciate you coming today on the tea table, and I hope that you find some good discoveries this summer. And if you have a comment on Sir Francis Drake or anything I've talked about, please make it. Any questions, please ask them. I want this to be a conversation, if possible. And make sure that you take time for you have a nice cup of tea. And this is my little geranium today. And this is, I think I've talked about my blue and white. I love flowers in blue and white pots. Aren't these just lovely dahlias? And these go all through the fall. I noticed behind me, I have a maple tree coming up. I've got to get my son out here to cut it down. I'm losing my view as we speak. Everything grows in this state. When there's so much rain, it's grow, grow, grow. So you cut it. It's like, like I said another time, it needed a haircut. It needs a haircut today. Okay, well, God bless you all. And I hope that you've enjoyed this. And make sure you read some kind of a good book or research some kind of a good topic so that you kind of know summer has, you've learned something. I think we all need to learn new things and go to different, um, different places. And if you can't go physically, you can go with a good book, yes. And in fact, I'll show you, I'm playing for the people who want to know the music, it's Corelli and it's recorder music, which is almost that era, 1600s. This is a book and it's called The Organ Trail. And it's illustrated with some really beautiful, let's see. And I am going to try to read this book too because I feel it, it all, everything, sorry, my hat's coming off. Everything relates because the Oregon Trail, they would never have come on the Oregon Trail if Lewis and Clark had not come out here and told them they could, right? And Lewis and Clark probably couldn't have done a lot of what they did along the water without those maps from Captain Vancouver. He made, he made their life easy that had already been done. So we have something to offer our people, our world, our children, our family, whoever we influence. We can do something that makes them want to do the next thing. Isn't that great? That's what life is made of. So step out of the boat. Don't be afraid. Go for the next thing. Go for your dream. God is with you. Thank you so much. Have a great week.